There are times when only the heartbeat of a man tells us feels. This is Rebel 6, request dust off. Dust off, over. This is Rebel 6, request dust off. Request dust off. More than 6,000 times last month, this call was heard and answered across the jungles, mountains, and rice paddies of Vietnam. Dust off 3-1. Dust off 3-1. This is the story of a handful of wounded and a handful of the 150,000 men and women whose only job it is to save the lives of men, if need be, at the cost of their own. Central Vietnam and a province believed vital for the security of Saigon. After many days of quiet, ominous sniping, our position is threatened. The patrol has been ambushed and is tied down. This is a war fought on the ground by troops brought in and out by helicopter, for we control only the land we stand upon. The front, as it has been understood in other wars, is where you are facing at the moment. Dust-off is a call for help. It was the call signal of the first commander of a helicopter detachment. Since he was killed in action, it has become the universal cry for an air ambulance. Three litters. The type of injury is urgent. Shrapnel wounds. They will identify with smoke. The area is insecure. Okay, bring the map out with you. Yankee uniform. Oh, here, right here. One four four zero seven three. Okay. These are men of the 283rd Air Medical Detachment, and as is the practice when an engagement is mounted, they are in the field as close to the action as possible. Marcelino Burgos, Specialist Five, Brooklyn, New York. Chief Warrant Officer T. C. Gibson Jr., Philadelphia, Mississippi. Specialist 5, William Nelson, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Captain Bill Colbert, Knoxville, Tennessee. This is mission number 404. Tuned to our radio frequencies, the Viet Cong can and do imitate our procedures, ambushing our rescuers. It isn't until the helicopter is within rifle range that its crew can be certain who awaits them. And they are further disarmed. Since they exhibit the Red Cross, they may carry weapons only for the protection of their patients, not for themselves. I want to tell them that they're British, we're going to have to switch because they have mass casualties up here. And uh, we got to get up there and get them. Okay, sir. Uh, got four, uh, you be uh, left. Uh, I got to check yep. this out. I think I may have you running that now. Uh, this is Mustang 3-3. Uh, three, three. Get off the air for approximately 0 2. We have a, a dust off in progress. They're on this push. Out. Foxcat Bravo 5, dust off 3 1, over. Uh, this is Bravo 5, uh, Roger. We can hear you now, over. Uh, Roger, I'm above the clouds at this time. I have an APC with a panel marker on it at this time. Is If you could uh, confirm that it is one of yours, we'll come down through a hole, over. Uh, this is Bravo 5. Uh, We've got uh, quite a few down here with monitors on over. Uh, Roger, how much enemy contact did you have prior to our arriving over? Uh, we've had sporadic contact uh, all morning over. Uh, Roger, uh, what's the best direction of approach into your area over? This is Bravo 5. Uh, suggest you come in from the uh, southwest. Do not go uh, in the area to our northeast over. Uh, Roger, that's uh, about where we are at this time. Uh, go ahead and throw a smoke now, and I'll see if I can pick it out, over. That's Bravo 5. I will go. This is uh, Bravo 5. Uh, have you uh, located our smoke, over? Yes, 3-1, negative. Bravo 5, dust off 3-1. We're coming down through a hole, so if you can keep smoke uh, in the area until we locate it. Appreciate it, over. Roger, we have purple smoke. Is that affirmative? This is uh, 
mother's daughter was shot while quietly riding a bicycle with her father on a public lane in a little village in the warm sun of a beautiful day. She will be dead in an hour. Four members of this family have died this afternoon between noontime and dinner. Captain Lloyd J. Easton, ROTC, who was a pharmacist and was, before he became an executive officer, the manager of a fairway drugstore in Woodburn, Oregon. And the work here is different.
Rogers, 3-1, we should be in your location in uh, about uh, zero 2 Can you throw smoke for us now, over? Aldrich, while performing his daily chores as a foot soldier, stepped upon a claymore mine. A metallic fragment entered his left flank. It shattered his spleen, destroyed part of his kidney, went into and is lodged in the left upper lobe of his left lung. Sixteen minutes later, he is here. Blood over here. Hey, hook up that blood. Come on, let's go, Ron. Come on, people. What's wrong? He cannot be given an anesthetic and live. in during the same engagement, a Viet Cong shares the operating room. The prognosis for both these young men is questionable. For some, the prognosis is no longer in question.
Piteously, there are those who fall and we cannot make them rise. Dennis Aldrich wounds are stabilized so he can continue his journey. For those who live, this is stage one of several stages in the concept that if a man is hit in this unwelcomed war, it is as if he were hit on the front steps of a hospital. A hospital. Doctors, nurses, medication, all stretching in a continuous comforting bandage 9,000 miles to his own bed. For dust off 31, Mission 404 is done. 405, 406, 407, 609, 1,098 are all ahead of them for as many numbers as men can count for as long as they are needed. In Saigon, in a remodeled and guarded apartment building, are the headquarters of the Far Eastern Joint Medical Regulating Office. It is staffed by the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force. It is from here that the life of the casualty is guided to the hospital best equipped to handle his particular injury, to the doctor best prepared to heal him. Regulating in Saigon. I've got two add-on and a change in destination. Aldrich, that's A-L-D-R-I-C-H. Initials, Dennis D-H. Dennis H, that's right. Wound, left, back. From the heart of the injured, through the fingers of the teletype, the world knows a soldier has been struck down. His rank, his condition, his needs are noted. And over the globe, hospitals are alerted. Aircraft are sent to bring them together. The center of this protective network is the briefing room at the Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Under the command of General Howell M. Estes, Jr., directives go to 100 air bases in 40 countries from these daily sessions. Good morning. Good morning, sir. There are 33 C-141 missions moving, which include 19 channel traffic, 8 special missions, 4 air evac, and 2 embassy flights. There is a Yerevac on time en route to McGuire, a special mission en route to Bedford, Massachusetts. The Clark to Travis Yerevac has been extended to Kelly to airlift an urgent burn patient to the Brook Army Hospital Burn Center. There are also 32... Stand by. Surgeon, how about this uh, urgent case en route to Kelly? Is this a serious, very serious condition? The prognosis looks quite good. Uh, he has about 35% burn have the lower extremities and part of his abdomen. Mm -hmm. We have any special medical attendants aboard? Yes, sir. We have a flight surgeon aboard to attend him. Good. All right, please. There are also 32 litter patients and 26 ambulatory on board destined for hospitals in the southwestern United States. It's an AeroVac inbound to Washington, the Clark AeroVac on schedule en route to Hickam. The Saigon AeroVac, now en route to Washington, is carrying 12 litter and 22 ambulatory patients. And the mission en route to Hickam has 16 litter and 24 ambulatory <coughs> patients. Uh, stand by one. Uh, surgeon, since we started that direct run from Saigon up over the northern route into Andrews, have we had any particular expressions from the patients as to whether any of those legs are too long for them? Are they, is their medical condition being affected by the longer legs on that run? No, sir, their condition is not affected and they're overjoyed to get to their destination rapidly. Fine. Okay. All route wind factors in both the Atlantic and Pacific are near normal today. A scattered thunderstorm activity also throughout the Philippines with rain showers at most of the island stations. Visibilities will be restricted to one half mile in fog at Taipei. Visibilities will also be restricted to a half mile in fog in the Yokota Tachikawa area between 1800 and 2200 Zulu today. Weather, can you expect any uh, abnormal degree of turbulence for that flight? Uh, negative, sir. All our reports indicate only light turbulence along that route. The turbulence that concerns General Estes is often encountered by aircraft leaving Tansunut, Saigon's airport, and it is the comfort and well-being of patients like Dennis Aldrich that the general and his staff wish to assure.
In the weeks since we have seen Specialist 4 Aldrich, he has been to several hospitals. The third surgical hospital, the 97th evacuation, and finally he has just left the 377th. All this for surgery to repair the considerable damage he had sustained. Yet there is more to be done. And in the policy of taking the patient to the doctor rather than the other way around, Dennis is arriving in the Clark Air Base Hospital in the Philippine Islands. Waiting for him is Dr. Lewis Patterson, the noted chest surgeon. It is his turn to examine the arrivals, check their condition, and assign them for further treatment. Every facility, every ounce and touch of kindness and skill is to be expended on their rehabilitation. There is barely a moment when they are permitted to forget this. What's your name? What's that? but feel some apprehension about are we going to be able to manage these boys? It's going to be a problem we haven't met with before. And even though we've had a plane a day now for a year or so, uh, you just can't help but feel that there's a new challenge. When well, Dennis Aldridge uh, received a metallic fragment wound of the left flank, and he's one of the boys that's very lucky to be alive. When he got here, uh, our x-rays show this retained large metallic fragment in the left upper lobe. It is our policy to remove these fragments because we know that when they have a metallic fragment of this size in their lung that they are going to get into trouble sooner or later. The, the injuries in this war are different than previous wars from one aspect and that is the, the velocity of the missiles. The, the M14 rifle, for example, is much faster than uh, the missiles of the previous wars. And this imparts an awful lot of energy as it passes through the body, killing tissues at quite some distance from the actual path of the missile. Yeah. So the very first patient that I lost on, of a pure chest injury came in here and within 24 hours in bad respiratory distress. His whole right lung was practically destroyed. And I did an operation on him, at which time I had to make a decision. Should I take out his whole right lung and leave him a cripple for the rest of his life? Or shall I attempt to patch, mend the remaining lung? Uh, I chose, as turned out wrongly, to attempt to mend his right lung. He got a bad empyema and died. Uh, 
these, this type of thing just, uh, you, you'll never forget that type of patient. Yet, on the other hand, this made me work all the harder and on these, on saving lungs. And we have quite a series since then of successful uh, primary repairs of wounded lungs. No, I guess you just like. When you really stand back and have time to stop and and think, uh, it's just a, such a tremendous waste of of human lives and human limbs, and so much suffering involved. Uh, my only hope is that it's worth it all. For the sick, nights are one year long and dawn a welcome friend. With the light morning breeze comes the hope that this day will be better than the last. It is three days since Dr. Patterson went exhausted from his operating room, having met the challenge which in all our hospitals has resulted in returning 99% of our casualties to life. These first unaided steps are a quiet victory for all those who have held Dennis' future in their hands. Though the journey is not over for this battered boy, he is on his way. Air Force nurses Captain Dorothy Brooks and Marge Selger, specially trained to man an air hospital, it was a little later before they got home and to sleep. It's now not yet 6 a.m. Their days are not measured in hours, for they are a special variety of caretaker and are on constant call. Today's evacuation from Clark through Japan to the United States is to be theirs. 25 patients, including Dennis Aldrich, are to be prepared by the hospital nurses, the flight captains, and the doctors for stage three on the journey to recovery. Good morning, Dennis. How are you this morning? Hi. Feel like going home yet? I'm ready. How's that arm doing? That's pretty good. You can move the arm See you move that shoulder. Ready to go about 10 rounds? I don't know about 10 rounds, maybe five. Maybe five, okay. Yeah. But don't be too good, we're allowed to send you back over there. Mm. Oh, I don't think I feel very good. You don't, th you don't think you'd like that? No. Had enough of the VC? Oh, for a little while, anyhow. Raymond Hagel, upon whom a bunker fell, and who is now a paraplegic. Good morning, how are you? Hi, ma'am. Fine. I'm Captain Brooks. I'm one of the flight nurses that's getting today's flight ready that you're going home on. Just came by to say hi, see if you have any questions or problems, and tell you a little bit about your trip. Do you have any questions offhand? No, ma'am, I'm ready to go. Okay, fine. How long have you been on this frame? A little over two weeks. Okay, so then you are used to being on it and being turned on it. Yes. Are you able to move your arms at all so that you can feed yourself? Yes. Do you usually eat on your back or do you prefer on your on stomach? Back. On your back. Okay. We will be transporting you on this frame and we will be turning you in flight on this. Is there any particular position that you're more comfortable in? I like so to put on the back to your stomach. Okay. Fine. Then we can turn you, say leave you on your back for a couple of hours and then turn you onto your stomach for an hour just to get you off your back for a short while. Where's your home? Philadelphia. So is mine. <laughs> I'm right outside of Philadelphia. You have to say hello to Philadelphia for me. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to know what sort of bandages you have. I see a wire sticking out there. Yes, the whole thing is wired together. Oh, can you move your fingers? This one doesn't want to move. You do quite well. Are you able to... Uh, Use that hand for cutting things or opening things? No, I cannot. Or can you eat with your uh, left hand? Yes, I can eat with it. Kind of clumsy, but I can eat with it. We'll be glad to help you. No, I'd rather do it myself. We use a C-141A. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that. No, oh, I believe it's the same kind of plane flew to Vietnam. Yeah, you probably did. They are using it to fly troops and cargo. Mm -hmm. uh, well. You know that it's just a big cargo airplane, big right? Yeah, it, uh, it's certainly not plush at all. Anything to get me home, that's all. Where's your home, Dad, in the States? It's Wisconsin, I think. Cold part of the country. Oh, 
just part of the thing. It's good weather. Okay. Four Excellent. seasons. Good what? Four seasons. Four seasons. You like four seasons? Yes. You anxious to get back? Oh, I'm in a real hurry to get back. You have someone back there waiting for you? No, just my family. Mother, father? Mother, father, five sisters and two brothers. Five sisters? Right. <laughs> no girlfriends? No. You didn't leave anyone behind? No. You have to pick fine with someone when you get home. Oh, a bunch of them, I hope. A bunch of them? Yeah. Boy said when he first saw this ship coming to take him home, it is as if God came out of the sky. The craft is the C-141, and statistics aren't needed to tell us its size. The bookkeepers can tell us it is expensive. The pilots can boast of its cruising speed. But to the boys who have been on it, for all its magnificence and strength, it is a box. It is a wing. It is the way home. comes in as a tightly packed warehouse, a cargo vessel. In an hour and a half, it can be unrecognizable. Its function, its character, even the way it will be flown will be radically altered. the flying warehouse will be transformed. Each individual flight is configured to the needs of every patient that will come aboard. In effect, each flight is a handcrafted, specially designed hospital ward. The conversion starts with the placement of the comfort pallet. Modern technology makes provision for all eventualities. Seats for the ambulatory patients and for those still on litters but well enough to try to advance to an upright position before they get to their people. Oxygen inches from everyone. Individual medication is small reach away for instant administration. to take her post with Captains Brooks and Selger is Major Lola Ball, chief nurse of this division. 
Once a month, as supervisor and instructor of her wing, she travels this route. Unless there are most unusual circumstances, there is no doctor aboard, and the chief medical officer is the nurse in charge. On this flight, it is Captain Dorothy Brooks. We have six. There's four located here. There's one on each side in the rear. How much oxygen do we have on board? We have 60 liters plus, ma'am. Okay. Uh, how about walk-around bottles, Sergeant McIntosh? We have seven walk-around bottles. And, uh, okay. Does everybody on the crew have their mask? Uh, yes, ma'am. They'll be hooked up later. Okay, fine. You'll see that they're hooked up before we take off. We're right, ma'am. Okay. We will put the striker patient here, and the rest of it will be as is. I think if this... Uh, is complete, I think we can go ahead with the loading. We will start with this patient here and just follow through. We'll load this side and then we can load the ambulatory patients while we're loading here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. I'll check with Captain Salt and see if she's ready and then we can go. Okay. Here, I'll give you the floor plan. All right, you thank you very much. Are you all set? You ready to load? Yes, yeah, ready to load. Okay, let's turn it. cargo, patients aren't passengers, patients are patients. This requires a gentle skill rarely achieved by average men. When you see a plane filled with young men who have been severely, traumatically, and suddenly injured by the effects of war, probably most of them are just from home for six months, a year, the first time away from home. The basic feeling really is that um, I'm not there. I could be, but for the grace of God. Patients are the end result of a nurse's long, particularly
particularly a flight nurse, is long striving to do something for someone who really needs her, who really needs to have her help and to do something that, uh, that she's been trained for all her life. And certainly in flight nursing, you use everything you've ever been trained to do. Very often you use all of this in one flight. It can be frightening to think that someone else's life is in your hands. But through training, plus the fact that there's no one else around, and all that you can do is to hope that you make the right decisions. Our patients that are take back to the United States, our young boys, they were boys when they left Travis and went over. But you wouldn't dare call them a boy on the way back. I think they use us as mirrors to see how we react to them. They can see how they look in a mirror themselves. And but we would be their mirror to them on a plane, how we would react to them. And if we would react violently, this is how they would get the conception, not how they themselves look to themselves. It bothers you that these fellows are young. I don't know whether it makes any sense or not as to why they're injured. I don't think about it, I don't understand it. You, you can't stop and, th and think about this. The problem is to see what you can do with them from here on in. How do you help rehabilitate them? Most of them think about what they are going to do when they get home. A lot of them think about how long it will take them to recuperate and be returned to duty. Some patients reveal their anxieties by being extremely quiet. I think some of these fellows are afraid to voice some of their anxieties because they're it would be maybe unmanly to do so. And you have a communication that you don't have to put into words, that just the patients and you just feel. The closeness that a flight nurse and a patient has, perhaps, is that they're, they're sharing a common experience. They're both alone. They're both away from home. They are supporting each other in that uh, the patient is looking for the nurse to help them, and I think the nurse, in a, in a great sense, is looking to the patient to give her the, the sense of responsibility that she has. When I first went to Vietnam, I was uh, a little uh, trying to actually visualize what it was going to be like. I didn't really know. In a way, I was sort of glad to go over there. Then uh, yeah, I was a little scared, too. Gently cradled now, warmed by affection and care, the men in their hospital fly from the world of war to the sweetness of home. The night is no longer the enemy's ally. Sunset brings healing sleep, reflection, remembrance. Sometimes you dream you see somebody getting hit or something that happened before and you remember it in your dreams. So I've had several dreams where Actually, I just almost relived something that happened before. This was after I was in. Well, our platoon was selected in that morning to go out on a patrol, just a search and clear type patrol. And it was a hot, humid day, and the ground was all wet, the rice paddies were flooded. I just walked across the rice paddy dike and was walking into the water. The water was fairly deep, just about up to my knees, that I felt myself getting hit and then heard the explosion. And then I was thrown to the ground during the explosion. I heard the people yelling for the medic. Some of the other guys ran over and pulled me up out of the water and got me back to the dike where it was dry. The medic was there by that time bandaging me up and uh, there was somebody yelling that we'd need a helicopter to get me out of there. Is that three children? Got two boys, Captain Brian. Seven and eight, and a little girl, Sheila. Last time I saw him was a year ago, December. Well, shouldn't be too long. 
one hospital close to home, so it shouldn't be too long. Warner High's going to make it 11. If you ever get off of the stretcher, how long it's going to take, things like that. And I've been thinking, but I haven't come up with any answers yet. The main thing is to try to get off this, this frame here. Get him halfway back in shape. Well, you think about a lot of things. What you've done in your life, what you're going to do. Think about home. About everything, I guess. Try to pass the time. It's impossible not to become attached to any patient, whether you're with him for five minutes or many days. The nursing, I think, has uh, compassion that most people do not understand. Nursing is a way of life. It's, um, as a soldier would be a soldier, nursing is a way of life for nurses. Leaving nursing or getting out of nursing could be compared with missing, suddenly missing or not having a limb. It would be like taking part of you away. On course, on glide path. Heading 353. On course, on glide path. Over approach lights. Heading 353. On course, on glide path. Over end of runway. Thank you very much, GCS. Very good run. 27, Roger. Continue taxiing straight ahead. Turn left at the next blue lighted intersection. Follow me. We'll assist in parking. Do you remember them? You don't always remember every face and every name, but you do remember specific ones. You remember conversations, or looks. Leaving a patient or having him leave you is sort of like leaving part of your family. At 826 Forest Street, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, as in many corners of the land, a family nervously awaits the return of a young man. The boy need not be a hero. He need not be a prodigal son. He need only to have done his job. He need only return safely, for every surviving soldier is a hero. Hi, Jeffy Clug. 